Now to properly welcome everybody uh, to um, this evening's uh, lecture, both online and in person. This is the third research seminar of summer 2023, which uh, is a series that was co-organized with Rikst Woodstra, who is not here in person, but is joining us online. So hello, Rikst. Um, it is a great pleasure to welcome everyone here and online to the fourth event. Um, and the series really thinks about the um, porous relationships and boundaries between the arts and the, lands and the landscape and spaces that we inhabit. So the hope for, for the whole series has been to create conversations that allow us to think expansively about wh what art is and what ar architecture is as well. So last week we heard from Moa Carlson um, about wide, the wide-ranging impact of coal on the British national landscape as well as architecture. And this week, we will continue with a very different but an incredibly relevant and important topic, the relationship between architecture and disability. In today's lecture titled the Architecture of Disability, our speaker, David Kisson, will explore a set of new ideas from his book with the same title, published this year with uh, the University of Minnesota Press. Instead of seeing disability as an afterthought or a separate category as it has and still often is considered to be, the book positions it at the heart of the environment. How can architects and designers cater to a wide range of human ability and how can cities be designed, be designed for a vast variety of physical experiences? As some of you who come regularly to our events uh, will notice, David's work uh, and today's talk is pushing us also to think critically about the physical space of the Pullman Center, the challenges of being in a listed building, uh, and how we run our events. Uh, usually our events are held uh, upstairs in the larger lecture room uh, and live stream for audiences online so people can watch uh, from home. This evening we're trying out a different model uh, where the lecture takes place on the ground floor in this seminar room. It is a smaller room, but so as to not restrict numbers, uh, we, all, we are also live streaming the talk upstairs if we have more guests than this group can hold. Of course, this is not necessarily an ideal solution, but it is a trial uh, and an experiment that opens up a conversation and concrete steps about how we run events uh, here. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> That's okay. <Sorry. laughs> Thank you. Um, but personally, it's also really exciting to see scholarship and uh, practical ways of being overlap, um, not just this evening, but as a part of an ongoing conversation and kind of structural change um, within institutions and the academy. Um, I'd just like to briefly introduce um, our speakers tonight. Uh, David Gisson is Professor of Architecture and Urban History at Parsons School of Design, the New School, and a visiting professor at Columbia. Uh, before coming to Parsons, he taught at the uh, California College of the Arts, as well as Yale University, the Ac Academy of Fine Arts in Vienna, and at MIT. And he completed his PhD very close to here at UCL, around the corner. Um, so in addition to his work on architecture and disability, he has written widely about architecture, nature, and the environment, which resulted, for example, in the book Subnature, Architecture's Other Environments, in 2009, as well as Ma Manhattan Atmospheres in tw uh, 2013, an uh, alternative hi environmental history of New York. His architectural and design work has been exhibited at the Venice Biennale, the Canadian Center for Architecture, and the Center for Architecture in New York City. Um, David Gisson's talk will be followed by a short response from Joss Boyce, uh, an architect as well as an activist, educator, and writer. Uh, she's one of the founding members of the Matrix Feminist Design Cooperative, which was the subject of a wonderful exhibition last year, The Barbican. With Matrix, she published the 1984 book, Making Space, Wim Women and the Man-Made Environment. In addition to this, she has also done extensive work on architecture and disability. Together with Zoe Partington, she's the co-director of the Disordinary Project, which rethinks disability in architectural design, discourse, and practice. In 2017, she published Disability Space Architecture with Rutledge. I feel like we've talked a lot about different titles and projects, and, and I hope we will have time after um, both um, sets of, kind of talk, the talk and the response um, to talk about uh, how things relate. Uh, and we have a reception um, with wine um, next door. Um, so feel free to, to come to that, stay on for that. Um, and welcome. So over to David. Thank you. 
Um, thank you, Sri, so much for that um, introduction. And thanks to you and Rix for bringing me here. Really, really appreciate it. And thanks to Joss for agreeing to respond to all this. OK. So um, I want to use this time to take you some, through some of the key ideas and methodological concepts um, in the book, The Architecture of Disability. You can see the cover here. Um, with these three staircases um, uh, on it. I'll describe this image later. And, and various times through this lecture, I'll also be describing images in case people are participating who don't see well. Um, so, okay. So one of my, um, and oh, and then I'll explain um, some of the themes in one particular chapter at the end that relates directly to what um, Shreya was talking about just a moment ago in terms of historic artifacts and how they relate to disability. So in this book was to create what I call an architecture total. Um, and that by that I mean I wanted to write a book about architecture and disability that engage subjects that are typical in architectural theory. So for those of you that are not architects or architectural historians in the room, architectural theory is a thousands year old genre of writing that basically lays out the principles by which architects and, and today, the discipline um, um, directs its work. Okay. Um, so typically, works of architectural theory outline an author's approach to um, the history of architecture, like how, how one might think about the history of architecture and the study of it, um, problems of cities and urbanization, aesthetics, and um, the creation of architectural through like formal manipulation or design. Um, concepts of construction, what's called tectonics. Tectonics is the, the aesthetic sensibility of a building as a constructed object. And then more and more archi today, architecture's relationship um, to nature and environment. So an architectural theory of disability simply offers a disabled lens onto these <coughs> topics. So I'd contrast an architectural theory of disability to the way that disability is typically approached in writings on architecture. So typically, disability is presented as a kind of um, self-evident architectural problem of access and increasing the accessibility to space. So works that examine the problems of access, they often examine the kinds of disconnects between a disabled person's physiology and the relative functioning of existing and future buildings and built spaces. So just, I'm saying this simply, I'm sure many of you know this, but an, accept, an accessible building is simply one that disabled people can use more fully, but also one in which the tensions between the kind of functional needs of disabled people and the space that they utilize begin to disappear. So in developing an, an, an response to that, something different, an architectural theory of disability, I just didn't want to complement a more typical and historic focus on the problem of access in architectural writing. I also wanted to air some of my own um, frustrations with the kind of functionalist bias and basis um, that underlies most um, architectural approaches to access. So a functionalist interpretation of architecture suggests that a building can be designed to optimize or promote a specific task, often defined in very biomechanical terms. So the early writing of the German architect um, Hugo Herrink on functionalism might be um, some of the most clear of this type. Like many functionalists, he was an architect who often used um, language derived from biology to describe um, ideal buildings, such as fitness, task completion, or the term function itself, is a, which is a biological term. So the problem I see with disabled people embracing a purely functionalist value system for architecture is that disability itself, the, the category of being a disabled person, is often a functionally defined category of humanness or impairment from a human perspective. So one of the ways disability is defined is when an impairment of some sort is determined to be um, biomechanically insu insufficient or inefficient. It's a negative, or to use a term from disability studies, it's a medical view or a medical concept of impairment and that is resolved by either transforming the non-functioning, the, the offending aspect of the impairment or the surrounding environment. 
And the trans this transformation makes an impairment into something that is more biomechanically normative or that enables task completion. I know we have very brief time, but let me give you a quick example. So recently I had the experience of being scored by a physical therapist for the first time in almost 30 years, in which this person had me walk back and forth in a room, walk toe to toe, walk upstairs. And they, I wear, I'm an amputee, wears a full length artificial leg up to my hip. And so I was deemed not disabled, with the exception of my ability to walk upstairs, which they considered me to have a, dis a very serious disability. And so they presented me with two options. I could work with this physical therapist to remediate my dysfunctional body, <laughs> or they could have me get in touch with a social caseworker who could help me make modifications in my home so that my disability would be less of a problem, quote unquote. Okay, I don't have a problem walking upstairs. I like the way I walk upstairs, but for my physical therapist, this was a, an offense that I think I scored a one or two on climbing upstairs where I scored an eight or a nine in terms of my ability to walk. Okay, so this admittedly crude example helps illustrate how, um, how in many ways, not always, but the pursuit of access and architecture can often, not always, but can often emerge from a functionalist interpretation of both people having disabilities and design that can be implied to impair people. So an examples that many of you may be more familiar with is that the common diagrams of accessible design strategies, and they often illustrate wheelchair users doing things like putting a cup in a cupboard or going to the bathroom um, or showing the range of motion within a space are a much more common illustration of a functional approach to access. Okay, so I'm not alone in seeing problems or tensions with the crude functionalism behind many definitions of disability or the accessibility strategies and imagery. Joss Boyce is certainly one person who's criticized them. Um, in the 1970s, Ray Lifshitz, who's a Berkeley-based architect and educator, did something that was seen as like a, a major rupture in how architects study disabled people. Instead of filming disabled people, as my physical therapist did, he attached um, film cameras to their wheelchairs or other devices that they may use to understand the world from their perspective. Okay, it's a very big difference. He's still concerned with the problems of use, but it was much less coarse. Now, today's years later, I have colleagues who are very critical of the mechanical character of functionalist solutions to, to access, and they often advocate for a more diverse, diversified approach to this. So these include um, approaches that advocate for an embodied or phenomenological or approach to access. A lot of this often um, considers how sound or tactility or vibrations uh, made, for example, like a blind person's navigation of space, or how auditoria may be raked differently to enable more efficient communication and sign language. For example, if I was signing so the people in the back would be able to see my hands more easily. I respect this work and I think it's very important, but I often find that it often just extends an interest in design and biophysicality into more and more kind of ethereal aspects of the surrounding environment. So in the architecture of disability, I wanted to more fully challenge the way functionalist ideas almost always find attachment to disabled people's lives. And so in doing this, I had a lot of allies because, again, for those of you who've studied architecture, architectural history, or contemporary architectural theory, you know that the very definition of a late modern or a postmodern architecture is its critique of functionalism or late modern or postmodern urbanism. So I'm referring to many different um, kinds of um, approaches that, that attack or criticize functionalism. Um, some of you may be um, familiar with French and German language situationists writing that talked about overcoming the rationalization of the city. Um, the work of Guy Debord or uh, Friedrich Stowasser called himself Hunterwasser examples. Aldo Rossi's concept of an architecture of the city that was about reviving the historical character of buildings to kind of make something that wasn't so crudely um, scientific or rationalized in its approach. Um, Peter Eisenman's work, or Bernard Schumi, who, who taught here for many years, are all examples of post-functionalist um, architects. So all of these authors inspired my thinking, but the problem is, is that many of them have very capacityist, or to use a term from disability studies, very ableist ideas about how we challenge functionalism. For example, situationist said that people from the city, they were often talking to like young men, that were very physically hale, should overcome the city and climb the rooftops to challenge the way that we move through cities and streets and sidewalks. Um, 
Bernard Chumi wrote about how like pole vaulting in a cathedral would challenge the kind of sensibilities of such a space or parachuting in elevator shafts. Um, the post and anti-functionalism of Peter Eisenman is, is much less physically intense. And in fact, the cover of my book um, responds to one of his most well-known constructions from the era when he declared himself to be a quote-unquote post-functionalist. This is house six. I know we have very little time, so let me just explain it very quickly. This house was um, designed and built in the mid-1970s, just as the United States was concluding its... Oh, okay. sorry. Just as the United States was concluding its um, war in Vietnam, and in many ways it challenged the kind of purity or um, innocence of an American home. It involved many different features that were about sort of making almost like a haunted American house, so to speak, including its staircases, which were very well publicized and famous. One staircase that you could actually walk to the second floor and use was painted green. One staircase that you couldn't use and sort of hung over your head in the middle of the house as a kind of intervention, a, a dysfunctional staircase, was painted red. So the cover of my book is a response to that, um, in a way playing with this idea of post-functionalism. The right side up staircase is red because from a disabled perspective, all staircases are a pain in the neck, um, are difficult or dysfunctional, so to speak. The upside down staircase is yellow because, you know, for us, an upside down staircase is as usable as a right side up staircase. And another staircase, which doesn't exist in the house or any of the drawings, is turned on its side and becomes something sort of resembling a ramp, and that's painted green. And so it's sort of playing with the fact that one must deal with access as a historic fact, but also signaling to a reader that this um, book is connecting to some um, historic um, ideas about architecture. Okay. So there are also concepts within disability studies that challenge functionalist definitions of impairment, but they haven't found much of a role in architectural writing. So for example, what's called the critical concept or critical model of disability argues that most concepts of disability um, think of disability as a kind of lack or negative that must be addressed either medically, environmentally, or socially. So the example that I gave of dealing with my physical therapist um, is an example that both relates to both a medical and a social model of disability in which the, my physical therapist see me as lacking in some way. Okay. By contrast, a critical concept or model of disability argues that disability is simply another lens on being human, one that contributes to society and culture. So adherents of this view use terms such as deaf gain or gaining blindness as ways to think differently about visual or um, oral um, impairments. Right? Both describe how language, writings, or works of art might move through and transform through disabled experiences. Um, the writing of Georgina Klieg or the recent film work of Alison Daniel, if this idea interests you, are good examples of gaining blindness or deaf gain. So, um, so okay. um, I know we're a little um, uh, short on time, so let me just, okay. An even more critical concept of disability than the quote unquote critical concept of disability is sometimes called disability justice. And this argues that disability is experienced unevenly within a social historical reality. And this of course is true, let me explain. So this presents a radical challenge to both medical and social definitions of disability um, that are actually very little explored, I would argue, in architecture, although they're beginning to be more and more. So the idea is that disability is experienced differently based upon things like race, gender, and class. And to put this very simply, in the United States, where I live, the majority of people that are diagnosed with disabilities are black and brown women, okay? I, I'm demographically, you know, speaking. So the, the, the differences in terms of the population of those um, social categories that are diagnosed with disability is much more significant than, let's say, wealthy white men, okay? Um, so, and, and um, these critical and even more um, critical concepts of disability inform my ideas because they also confront a functional definition of disability. If disability is experienced so unevenly based upon race and gender and class, then it can't be a functionally defined category, right? Obviously. Okay. So all of this informed my ideas, but curiously, the adherents of, of many of these disability justice ideas often still maintain that architecture's relationship to disabled people should by, primarily be concerned with the topic of access. Okay. So by contrast, I would define an architecture of disability 
not as a concept of architecture that evaluates how well it functions for disabled people, but a structural critique of architectural thought from a disabled perspective. So where most architects explore the utility of their practice for disabled people, a disciplinary and structural critique of architecture examines how impairment and capacitation are everywhere within architectural thought, within its histories, its theories, its practices, its pedagogy, even the production of architecture itself. By that I mean the way that we, we build buildings. Okay, so this relo relocates the problem of disability away from a focus of on use and towards a consideration about how impairment permeates our um, discipline. Okay, so that lays out some of the theoretical aims of the book. Um, this is the, um, ch just the chapter contents if you wanna look at that for a moment. Let me just say something briefly about methods and then I'll show a case. One of the, am I, am I okay with time? Yeah, I think I'm okay, okay. Um, so one of the more um, alienating qualities that I find as an architectural researcher and practitioner is what I call methodological athleticism. And I need to find a better term for that because that's a mouthful. <laughs> but by this, I mean that when like a historian or a architectural researcher sets out to write a book or is reflecting back on their work, oftentimes they'll say like, this book is the result of years and years of me scaling buildings in distant places, or an anthropologist, for example, would argue for the power of the work by saying, I lived in the Amazon without water, without food for years to develop my work. And so my problem is, is there's, a, there's a subtext to this, that the more physically intensive one's research is, the more intellectually rigorous it is. And in developing this book, I really want to challenge that. So where most um, books, not most, that's a vast understatement, where many books of architectural history and theory often rely on even the most subtle forms of methodological athleticism. Could just be a talent for multiple languages, for example. I tried to center my relative weaknesses in writing this book, and in many of the chapters, you're often hearing about what I can't do, which I think is a really powerful way to begin to develop a lens and a disabled lens on the discipline. Um, and very important to me. So one of the ways that you can experience that more generally as an ethic in the book is that all of the images in the book have alt text, which is not so untypical, but what that is is simply a, a bit of text that explains to a non-sighted reader what a sighted person can see, okay? Now what's different in this book is that often in alt text is buried in a file that only people that use access tools made for blind readers can hear or listen to, right? Like, you're looking at three different staircases, one's red, one's green, one's yellow. In this book, it's not only, not only is the alt text like directly under the captions, but oftentimes there's extensive alt text, almost a page long, and that is woven into the text so that you have this odd, maybe even strange experience as a reader of reading descriptions that you can clearly see on the next page, but you're maybe seeing it in a way that you haven't through reading, right? Which is an interesting experience. Additionally, in writing the alt text, I blew up the images to a scale that could not, you know, when I was writing it, that can't text that nobody can see. So just to give you something of a, of a taste of, it's a good example of how one might gain blindness, for example, in the reading um, of a book. Okay, so among the chapters, I just want to briefly outline one of them and relates to some of the theories and methods I just mentioned. So the first thematic of the chapter of this book, I'm just going to show you this one chapter briefly, offers what I call a disability critique of the monument and through a few different perspectives. It relates directly to what Shriya was talking about with this building before. So it, this presents a criticism of a contemporary practice called accessible heritage. And it also um, offers a kind of criticism of the aesthetics of history that we often build into historic sites. So the chapter begins with some reflections on a very famous um, episode of disability activism in and around the capital of DC, which you can see here in this image. This is an image of the west front of the capital taken um, in the early 20th century showing the cascading steps, the dome, the neoclassical facade, and the um, bronze statue at the top. Now I'm assuming most people, most of my readers know this building, and most of my readers who um, are disabled, in the United States at least, know this as the site of one of the most important disability protests in 1990. That event was called the Capitol Crawl in 1990. People like myself who used to use wheelchairs, or people in wheelchairs, um, or people that use crutches, people with mobility impairments, um, um, transitioned out of their chairs, dropped their crutches, and crawled up the four flights 
of stairs here to protest the delayed passage of the Americans with Disabilities Act. It was such a shocking um, uh, protest that the bill, the bill, the law, passed very quickly um, afterwards. It's very ironic because that they would do a protest that seems to be about access at this building, because this building is actually has been one of the most quote unquote accessible buildings in Washington DC since the 19th century. It's the first building in DC with a fleet of passenger elevators because the aged men who are congressmen and senators in the US, they don't want to climb up a bunch of stairs. You can enter on the ground floor and go up any number of stair, you know, any number of elevators. So it was a sort of, there was more to this protest, which was really about how the symbol of our, one of the symbols of our nation has a kind of odd relationship or even disparaging relationship to ideas about incapacity um, um, as well. Okay. Um, Okay, and I use the example of the Capitol and illustrate it with this 100-year-old image and to raise a very broad question, like what is a disability critique of a historic monument? Is it solely about making such structures more accessible or would engage other concerns? For example, the Capitol building was in constructed by enslaved craftsmen. It was destroyed by British troops in 1812. A lot of Americans don't know that. It was rebuilt with enslaved craftsmen soon thereafter. And of course, on January 6, 2021, it was violently occupied by right-wing paramilitaries and their allies. Okay. So in thinking about a disability critique of monuments, I ultimately turned to several other case studies and that are more central to architectural history um, as they are national ones, including this one, um, the Acropolis in Athens, Greece, to make a series of points. So this site that's canonical in histories of architecture, patrimony, and histories of architectural preservation is also central to contemporary debates over what's called accessible heritage that I mentioned earlier. So accessible heritage is the idea that one can balance the authenticity of a site with the need to make it more usable by disabled visitors. And balance is the central concept here between historical integrity of what you find um, or what you have and the necessary transformations that need to be made to make a building more accessible. You can see that idea very well in this photograph of the north face of the Acropolis um, in which you can see the rocky face of the surviving ancient um, uh, uh, geology of the site and this rickety construction elevator that's attached to its side. This was built, um, I believe, in 2004 and for the Athens Olympics, because when you hold the Olympics, you also hold the Paralympics, which is disabled sport, and people have to be able to attend all the events. When I visited the site, this was there, and I was offered to go up it, and I actually chose to walk up instead of going in the thing. But anyway. And by the way, the photographer who had this image told me that the woman inside was actually pregnant, so it's an interesting, it's actually an interesting photo. You can't see that, but it's an interesting photo. Um, okay, so where am I? All right, so um, the irony of the pursuit of balance, and at most sites, and maybe this site is a good example, um, is that many historical monuments, many sites like the Acropolis, but also places like Saint-Denis in Paris or Les Invalides, you know, the Veterans Hospital, among many, many other examples. They owe much of their historical authenticity to their engagements with impaired people. So for example, the Acropolis was once reached via a series of interconnected ramps. A lot of people don't know that. This was, in, this was 2,500 years ago. And it held several shrines that were built for and visited by impaired worshipers that came to the site specifically. So this is a photograph by Mantha Zarmakupi, Zarmakupi sorry, that shows the um, propylae of the Acropolis. And in the foreground, you can sort of make out these linear fragments. And that's all that's left of the monumental ramp that once fronted this building, which was one of the largest ramps in um, ancient architectural, the ancient architectural record. Um, so one of my points is, is not just simply that these buildings used to, used to be accessible, because how could we even really think about a contemporary idea so long ago. But one of the key ideas is that the physical inaccessibility of these sites is, is not an intrinsic aspect of them, it's actually built into them to make them take on our romantic idea of what historical experience is. And that's so important. And it relates to this idea of um, athletic um, methodologies. Okay, so for example, in much of the 19th century, in the early 19th century, when the um, Acropolis was um, part of the Ottoman Empire, the propylaea, the entrance, was reached via many different interconnecting paths of various steepness, okay? 
um, very different than how it's accessed today. Um, so today, it's reached through a path designed by the Greek architect Dimitri Pikionis, and that was built in the early 1950s. And this winding path takes visitors up the site in a rubble strewn and increasingly um, narrow and steep route that terminates into a single file path that you see here with these very exhausted looking tourists trying to make it up. One's using an umbrella because it's just so brutally hot there, as you know. Okay, so this reflects an idea that the experience of the past is one in which physical intensity is a form of knowledge of it. And it's an example of methodological athleticism, one that's built into architecture. And Dimitri Picciones didn't invent this idea. He just gave it a very convincing physical form. Now, monuments often hold um, other histories and relevant to disability history, very broadly conceived. Many, I, I would probably argue all, um, are sites of violence because they are historic sites. Think of the US Capitol again. And many were, or, and are violently transformed to represent very singular concepts of history. And the Acropolis is a great example. In the 19th century, the Bavarian architect, Leo von Klinze, cleared all evidence of Ottoman culture at the site, which not only involved demolishing what was one of the most beautiful mosques in Greece that was at the Acropolis, destroying all the villagers who lived in the Acropolis' homes, and also killing many of them, which often isn't uh, mentioned, in, to better transform the site into a more pure image of Hellenic neoclassicism. Okay. Now the Ottoman cemetery on the site, which is one of the few remaining um, 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 pieces that's still intact from that period, is actually just right against that elevator. If you go to the elevator, it's like right there. So it's an interesting kind of dialogue um, there. So what I call the preservation of disability is a response to these different histories and practices. The preservation of disability, um, which is not accessible heritage, um, considers how impairment, weakness, and experiences of violence might be a lens through which to reimagine and understand historical preservation, reconstruction, and restoration. So this is a picture of um, the archaeological park, I'm almost finished, at My Son in Vietnam that was the, um, used as a um, Viet Cong um, base. Um, this is a 15th century Cham ruin site um, that was restored by French archaeologists and was bombed very heavily um, during the US war in Vietnam. And you can see in the foreground this crater that's filled with water and uh, some of the surviving fragments in the back. So in thinking through this practice, I draw on a diverse range of thinkers, the blind art theorist Georgina Klieg, um, the deceased Lebanese curator Maurice Chabab, Berlin-based curator Julian Chapuy, and a deceased restoration theorist Cesare Brandi. And all of these people, well really Chabab, Chapuy, and Brandi are all concerned with the ways in which physical instability and trauma can be preserved into sites. So for example, Maurice Habab preserved ancient artifacts in the Lebanese National Museum's collection that were damaged in the Lebanese Civil War in the 1980s, but he preserved them in a damaged state. He refused to restore them. And so taking these bullet riddled and molten Roman and ancient Lebanese artifacts, he, he not, didn't restore them, but put them on display and tried to integrate them into the national history of Lebanese art. Very interesting approach. Julian, actually, let me just move forward. Okay, because I know we're almost out of time. Okay, so one other example is the Italian curator Cesare Brandi explored how damaged and might always be experienced in an indeterminate state. That is, they never feel really complete to us. So he developed a conservation technique that's called tratagio, um, which involves repairing the damaged or missing pieces of painting with little hatching, almost like a pointillist painting by Georges Seurat. And so from a distance, a restored work would look whole, but as you came up close to it, you could see both the restoration work, which was like little points of color, but also the damage that the work um, experienced. And this was an idea of conservation that relied on a beholder's optical perce perception of time um, and distance and through their position in space. And so one can enrich this, such an idea by considering how con conservation might also be experienced or even practiced differently through greater practices of physical and physiological indeterminacy. Like how could you relate to someone who's blind, for example? That technique is very much relies on opticality. How would you relate that to some other? way of perceiving artworks. So, in the end, I think a disability critique of the monument would conti continue to position or think about historic monuments as vulnerable things um, in the manner that many of those conservators and curators do. But here's where something's a little different. 
But these vulnerable things may take on innumerable characteristics and relative to our, or the incapacities and weaknesses of both their conservators <clears throat> and their beholders. And the latter possibility is something that I haven't experienced in a historical site. Anyway, thank you very much. Yeah. Um, thank you so much, David. I really enjoyed that. And I have to say, for me, this book, The Architecture of Disability, is a really very important book that offers kind of insights and provocations pretty well on every page. And I, if you haven't read it, I really recommend that you do. And I also think that David's probably the only architectural theorist and historian who could have written it, really, because I know that it's been the product of a very long gestation process, um, and I know that because I started reading the work of, of David, or his architectural research and critique um, that informed this publication, and that was like uh, 20 years ago, probably. Um, and finding David's work at that time was really crucial for me, because I was someone um, who was also trying to think about disability beyond access, but as a non-disabled architect-trained activist, and who was beginning to work with disabled artist Zoe Partington to create um, the Disordinary Architecture Project, we were really looking for what kinds of things really had an impact within the built environment disciplines and that didn't, weren't just kind of checklists of um, things that you'd left out, which seemed to be so common, as, as David said, in, in, and are still common, really, in the way... Um, education and practice is organised and, and in fact I was involved in setting up the Disordinary Architecture Project because that was in 2006, 2007 and I'd studied architecture in the 1970s and although the legislation had changed, actually the way the subject was taught and the way that disability was um, uh, just put in this tiny little bracket at the end as a kind of functional access need um, hadn't really changed at all. So. We wanted to look at how that might be different and, again, to do that beyond access. And at that time, I don't really think there was that much... Um, we might talk about this, David, about going on. There were historians like David Serlin, Bess Williamson, both um, American, and there was also this emerging field of disability studies that David's mentioned and had some engagement with. Uh, and in terms of the architecture and disability book, the reader that I put together, that was really about saying there's some really amazing work out there from disability studies activists and scholars that just doesn't penetrate into architecture and the built environment disciplines in any way. And it's kind of a real gap. And I think what's really important about what David's done is because he comes from within the discipline and he knows it really, really well, He's able to talk to the people in the discipline in a way that's also very radical. Um, so I think, you know, we've seen the work on the Acropolis, which I remember reading, um, and, and you also did some work in the 1990s as an architectural student at Yale about the experience of that, yeah. of, of Paul Ruder's building, but it wasn't about, again, it wasn't about access. It was about how you might develop a kind of architectural criticism out of that. So these are things that you've been going round and round in many, many ways. And for me, what was interesting is that I always read Subnature as a book that was about disability, even though at that time it wasn't necessarily the way you wanted to articulate it. So I think, um, you know, what is it that David does in this book? And I'm, I'm going to quote him directly because I think it, it is really clear what the intention is. And it is a structural critique of architectural thought through a disabled perspective, which re-examines how impairment and capacitation are already situated within architecture, history, theories, practices, pedagogy, and the production of architecture itself. Um, and the shorthand we used the discussion yesterday was disability critique. So... The very modes of practice that we have are themselves completely inculcated and embedded with ideas about what counts as able, what counts as disabled, what counts as the right sort of person to be an architect or the wrong sort of person to be an architect. And that sense that it's not just, that architecture isn't somehow kind of neutral and well-meaning and that if it just, you know, it just has to learn how to do these things better, it's actually right in there in every single thing that, um, that we do, and I think what's fantastic for me about this book is that it, it's very complete 
you know, it's one minute it's talking about, uh, as we saw with the monuments, but then there's a brilliant chapter on uh, construction. There's work on, um, on urban planning. There's work on environment. Every chapter kind of opens up a new lens on how you might think about those things. Um, so what I hope to do, um, now we'll have a brief chat and then we'll have a brief chat with everybody else, is I think there were kind of three areas and in a way this isn't, I'm just, these are things I would like to discuss with David. I'm just kind of asking you to be involved in them and I'm not sure he wants to discuss them with me, but, um, and this is his kind of warning. There's three points that I want to talk, three questions. And I know it's a very short warning. I think, first of all, it's for me, again, it's this thing about coming from within the discipline. It's about sources and methods. And what is an issue, I think, with really brilliant work from related fields like ethnography, anthropology, disability studies, feminism to some extent, although there's a very strong, obviously, feminist and architecture um, uh, field, is that... There is this revisiting of a tremendous range of well-known architectural writings from across history, um, from across kind of architectural theory, whether it's Hugo Herring or Gottfried Semper or uh, Sergio Ferro, um, and that's all done through a disability lens. And then that's brought together with a kind of interrogation of archival materials that have previously been ignored or marginalised, materials like the work in Vienna, where people have just never really talked about how important... Um, disabled activists were to the design of housing. Um, so it's bringing that in. It's bringing in both his own and other disabled people's experiences, particularly as in kind of campaigning. And it's referring to some key texts from disability studies, um, disability scholars and, and critics. So I'm really interested. There's a kind of intersecting sources. This is what I want to talk about, intersecting sources from both outside and inside conventional architectural history and theory, and to some extent from inside and outside the academy. And that, for me, is a very interesting thing because, first of all, I think for a non-disabled readership, and I'll be very interested in, in both uh, for people in the audience about this, if you don't know anything about disability studies, scholarship, activism, art practice, I'm really interested in what kind of responsibilities... We have, and I speak as a non-disabled writer about these subjects and activist in this field, what responsibilities we have to kind of enable new upcoming scholars, particularly actually disabled scholars, how they're introduced to and learn from and navigate this incredibly contested, wide-ranging field. do about that, what we, how we, what we do with stuff that comes from outside the discipline, how we engage with it thoroughly and completely, and that has personal complexities, which I've heard you talk about really clearly, you know, as a, if you're a disabled person in the arts or in architecture, you negotiate your own path about how much that's part of how you want to be seen and how much you... Yeah, you negotiate it, just like artists like Yinka Shonabari or um, Ryan Gander negotiate being disabled artists and really have only come out once they're famous. So there's a whole set of things that are just really complicated for um, uh, new disabled scholars coming into this field, which I'd, I'd love you to have, you know, say some things about. And also about what it is, yeah, what is our responsibility and what is the responsibility of non-disabled scholars too? if they work into this field, and not to misrepresent or misunderstand. Uh, the second thing is about the total theory. You said at the beginning, which I rather love, this is meant to be a total theory. I'm like, yay! But then I realised I realized that what I... that there was an element in the way that you write and the way that you put this together, which is both quite subversive and quite deliberately conventional. Maybe that's subversive, because for me it did remind me of those kind of architectural histories of... Maybe this is deliberate, the kind of, you know, Nicholas Pevsner and Peter Rader Bannum and Kenneth Frampton that I was brought up, you know, that we were, we were made to read in the 1970s, where there was a kind of very thorough um, historical analysis, um, but it had a twist because its aim was to persuade you about what should happen next. So I feel there's an element of that, and I'm just interested in... because. Within the field that I work, which is much more disability, arts and activism, it's much more about a kind of opening up and being much more vague about things and 
Um, whereas I think there is a whole kind of academic, you know, the academia is very competitive. Like, how do you position yourself in that field? So what do you do if you work in this area and you're trying to compete in that field? How does that affect how much you might also um, see the kind of more active, and I'm using that word a lot, but, you know, because to me there are huge activist components in this. It doesn't necessarily, you know, there's very many different ways of being an activist. So, um, and I think then there's a whole, that relates to a whole set of things about, about access and how we think about it. And I agree with you completely that it's really important not to centre it in the way that it has been. But again, I think there's been some really interesting work, um, which, is, which is a real critique of access, which, which really intersects with what you're doing. And I think you probably know that. People like Kevin Gotkin, who are writing about access ecologies. It's like, we all have access needs. And what we need to do is critique the access ecologies that mean that we build buildings for certain sorts of people and not others. So it takes the term access and it completely kind of makes it a, a critical term, I think. Um, and, there, and Amy Hamray, who looks at, but, you know, it sees it as a kind of social construction, really. So those are my two points. And my third point is much simpler, which is about what happens next. You haven't talked about practice, and there's a coda in the book about practice, a really interesting coda, and there's practice examples throughout. So I'd love you to talk a little bit about that. And I guess I'm really interested in what research you might have planned. Because for me, what this book does is open up. It's like you could now, every single person in this room could research for the rest of their life and you still wouldn't be filling all the gaps that we have in this subject area. It's like a whole new... It's the same field, but it's a whole new way of looking at the field that's really um, exciting. So thank you, David. Thank you for those provocations. <laughs> yeah, <it's good. laughs> I think that was making my job. <laughs> <laughs> that was very good. And an and, and honour, of course, because of your... Um, leadership in this um, topic. Yeah, so the, the disciplinary question um, is one that I wouldn't even say that I struggle with. Like I, let, actually let me back this up a little bit. So there is some very interesting work that has been made by architects who um, have become disabled. Um, in the United States, some of the most, two of the most famous examples is um, very late in his career, Michael Graves, um, had a, neuro a degenerative neurological disease in which he lost, um, or I should say, just, you wouldn't use that term in disability <laughs> studies, in which he could, not, he could not stand or use his arms or legs. And so he used a wheelchair. He began to make a lot of work um, as a disabled architect. Christopher Downey is an architect who practices in Berkeley who became blind after having a very long career in architecture. I haven't seen a perspective of somebody who's gone through each of the the steps that one does as one enters a discipline. First, being inspired, let's say, by a work of architecture. Going into architecture school and going through the process of education. Then going to work and practice for somebody as an intern and being kind of acculturated into the ways that people practice architecture. And then in my case, kind of leaving practice, going back to school, becoming a historian, becoming an academic. And so I really felt as if I had spent my entire life within this discipline as a, um, my life within the discipline was entirely as a disabled person. And so every step of the way, I have thoughts, reflections, anger, um, activism, as you say. And so for me, I wanted to do a project that, that was that kind of extensive and thinking about like everything from how one's inspired at a historical site, or who gets to be inspired at a historical site, to education of architects, um, to practice, to academia. So in that way, it's a, it's a super disciplinary book. And um, I think that's been a little difficult for disability studies people that have read it. I mean, there's been a very good response from people in disability studies, and they recognize that it's, let's say, a way of thinking about architecture that they haven't. At the same time, they're like, why don't you want to be part of our discipline? <laughs> yes, <laughs> you know? yes. Or why don't you remake the book? Why don't you want to book? be an all gang? Yeah, right. Why don't you remake the book? And I'm like, well, you know, I, I love architecture. I don't know. I am in, I'm inspired by some people in disability studies. I'm also, um, just like my um, issues around architecture, I am not. I have a lot of issues with a lot of work that's made in disability studies that is about buildings, right? I mean, it seems like buildings are only 
relevant or useful insofar as they satisfy some urgent and contemporary need. Like there's not a lot of historical thinking about buildings and disability studies, except to think about how they did or did not meet the needs of people in the past. So that gets to like the writing style. So I, I mean, I of all people, I've in my practice have done some very unusual experiments with how one can write as an architect. I've done some writings that try to recreate experience, some of the experiences I have not being able to hear well or not being able to see well in like very unusual experimental architectural texts. But I want this book to give me allies who are both um, disabled students and practitioners and academics, but also people that are not. Mm -hmm. And for people to really take a look at how they teach, how they practice, um, how they work as academics and, and the language that they know um, and to really self-reflect about that, you know. And then um, in terms of the final point, practice, you know, my, my friends in disability studies, chiefly Georgina Klieg, she read the book and she said, well, I know what you're going to do next. And I said, I was like, what, what, what am I going to do next? I'll probably write another book. She goes, no, you have to practice now, <laughs> you know, because the book ends with a code on practice. Um, so that I'm trying to figure out because it's still... You know, I can sit here and write about these limitations and things. It's, it's, it's still, and especially in New York, I don't like the term ableist. It's a capacityist profession, you know? And I still can't quite find a way to like say, like I am going to practice from this relatively incapacitated point of view. And how am I gonna do that? How am I gonna get somebody to pay for a project? You know, I could go on just a little bit longer, but um, I mentioned this yesterday in a conversation with two of um, Joss's colleagues at um, Postman's Park. But I'm working on a project now with Georgina Klieg, actually, um, in a very, it's in a very um, embryonic state at a historic um, house museum in the US. Um, and I think they wanted us to come to like help make this place more accessible. And we're uncovering histories of, just like I showed you here, of disability at the site itself that are making the managers of it, I, you know, I, I wouldn't say it's making them uncomfortable, but I think it's like, oh, like, you know, you're supposed to be here to help us, help people like yourself understand the site better. Yeah. And I think our attitude is we want to uncover um, the histories of impairment that are embedded in this place and make it what it is, but that aren't discussed. Um, so that's a disability, so to speak, or bring this into practice is not, it's still, there's still a lot of resistance to that, or, or, or resistance might be too strong a word. It makes people uncomfortable. Yeah. yeah. And so that I can't figure out. Yeah. And I think, I mean, I, I, it's on my list of things that I didn't mention, but it is, I feel that in some ways there seems to be a real difference in the US and in the UK. This is stereotypical, but it's also about ways in which one thinks of doing these more alternative forms of working. And I think, um, and I'm thinking of Joel Sanders too, who yeah. is somebody I very much respect, but in terms of thinking about practice, it's still within, a, it's a notion of a conventional practice that has, um, you know, real clients, which yeah. I'm not saying that's wrong, but there's that, that's a kind of model there. Whereas I think here, if you look, there's a really wide range now of um, different platforms that don't necessarily, they do architecture, but they don't necessarily do it through clients. They do it through their own, they, like, I mean, Assemble's a really obvious, you know, long-term right. example, but Resolve Collective, or I, there's just dozens of them. And there's a, real, there's a real interest, too, in, as there is in the States, actually, in challenging the kind of work press practices of obsession, yeah. very long hours, you know, that, exactly that yeah, yeah. kind of athleticism. Uh, of the kind of what it is to be an architect. So I feel like there's quite a lot of places, there's lots of ways which I think somehow don't seem quite so available to yeah. you, or it may be that you, don't, yeah. that you don't want to do that kind of practice, that you don't want to do something that's, I mean, you've been doing provocative work yeah. anyway, either educationally or in a wider sense. Yeah, I mean, I, had, I guess a fantasy among the dozen or so fantasy projects that I'd like to come out of this book. Um, <laughs> It, many of you probably know in the, in the 19th, um, towards even to the middle of the 20th century, <clears throat> people like myself, let's say, um, or people that are um, very seriously blinded or have PTSD were often brought into workshops to do manual work, to learn how to like 
you know, weave baskets or, you know, make, I shouldn't laugh, but, you know, it's so demeaning, right? Make brooms. Um, so I had this kind of fantasy of, like, taking myself and, and four or five or more people that all have very serious um, impairments and having us, like, twist that workshop model around and do, like, a kind of... Have, like, a building crew. A comment kind of workshop on that that I think yeah. could be really fascinating. But, again, how you find a patron um, to, like, be interested in, in, in bringing the money, right, to, yeah. to, to create the stuff... Um, that you'd want to create is, is, is difficult. But yeah, there's certainly alternative models of practice. And of course, being in academia, you have access to making things like labs or you yeah. know, other kinds of things yeah. that can do unusual work. Yeah. And in terms of research, have you got a kind of next project? You mentioned the next book. <coughs> yeah. I know it all takes time, but I just wondered. Yeah. Well, like I said, I think I'm trying to find projects. So, um, uh, so as this book was coming to a close, I worked um, with a very interesting group of, of mostly disabled team um, to redesign um, a very large area of Berkeley, California for a large exhibition that was about the future of the American city post-COVID. So I think that project's gonna have a few afterlives. Um, this project at a house museum that I mentioned, um, among a few other small things. I, I'm thinking through a few different kinds of book ideas, but not something that I can really talk about yeah, yeah. too easily. No, in front yeah, of yeah. all these people yeah, 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 yeah. have stolen from you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but the, the other thing I wanted to mention that was related to your first point was that, you know, I don't love writing an architecture book and saying like, okay, everybody, draw your attention to this group of like aged people that you've all had to read in architecture school. like. You know, as you say, like Rainer Banham, Gottfried Zampa, you know, all these people, Adolf Loos, of all people. Um, on the other hand, I'm like, maybe it would be good to draw the reader's attention to the fact that, like, Adolf Loos was deaf. And it's very likely that that informed his work and that he actually did some really, um, I think, amazing projects with a very large group of completely, dis you know, like very seriously disabled, wounded World War I veterans or you know, that Gottfried Zempa was inspired by those workshops that I was just mentioning when he was thinking about the hierarchies of craft and that weaving was the lowest and most kind of simple-minded of the crafts, whereas, you know, Ashlar uh, masonry was the most intellectually and physically hale and capacitated, an idea that comes right out of 19th century ideas of reform, yeah. right? So yeah. that was important, yeah. But I don't love... You know, I have to be honest, it, it, it hurts <laughs> to talk, to keep rehearsing these people that are part of our discipline. Yeah, yeah. no, though I... But, I oh, can I just say one thing? But I tried to yeah. balance that with, with very long passages in the book that are about much more recent work. And in the U.S., of course, as, as you all know, the most significant reckoning that's happening in architectural education in, in the U.S. is around the topic of race. And the kind of... Um, really significant transformation over the past three years in terms of um, um, building on the people of like Mabel Wilson and Mario Gooden and many other people um, in terms of think, rethinking like um, what architectural theory is and the topics of architectural theory. And their work is very strong, strongly represented in the book and very inspiring yeah. to me. No, it is. And I guess, yeah. I mean, I think just to finish off on that, because I think we'll ask if people have questions is... Um, Mitch For McKinney. me, you know, the notion of, you know, what this kind of very enabled, you know, the, the muscular, virile aestheticism is so much, it's also so much male, it's so much white, and the, yeah. the different ways in which capacity are understood. I guess I'm really interested in um, how one might explore how that plays out across, in different ways. So just thinking about those those assumptions and concepts about what sorts of minds and bodies matter, I think for me is a really, yeah. it's like the real fruitful beginnings of that. And yes, especially around race, I think, and to some extent gender as well as disability, you begin to talk about those things. And I guess for me, part of that working with quite a lot of um, disabled artists and architects is, I really love the way you do these kind of subversive concepts, like you look at weakness or you look at dirt or you look at dark rather than all mm. the things that are kind of just assumed to be perfect, you know, words like community or light or, <laughs> you know, that those things are kind of, they have so much built in assumptions that they're good words and I think good concepts. Um, but for me, I think again, and I'd be interested what some of the people you showed the book to, disabled people, because... I mean, I certainly know, well, you were there last night at the Deaf Architecture Front. A lot of deaf people would not 
connect the notion of weakness. They might have yeah. other concepts that are subversive. Yeah. Um, and I think that that, for me, beginning beginning to develop those kind of what that what that alternative language might yeah. be. And I think you do it really powerfully around weakness and capacity. But I feel like there's there's just an enormous range of yeah. alternative concepts we might bring to the discipline, bring yeah. to the party, really. Yeah, completely. In fact, um, one of the things about um, um, this event, this the last night, this launch of the Deaf Architecture Front that was so interesting, and and if um, if um, this book has another life of more additional chapters or something, is to talk about architectural representation. I mean, I've never seen a lecture delivered by delivered in sign language before by an architect. Um, it was amazing, and the fact that so much of his work around sign language is trying to figure out how to represent in sign language architectural concepts and ideas such as cantilevers and um, other kinds of terms, program, other kinds of terms that we use architecturally without spelling them out, yeah. you know, um, trying to find gestures for them. So, yeah, I think that's... <coughs> yeah, that's, it's Chris Lang and that project's called Sign Strokes and, yeah. and I recommend you also look at that. Um, sorry, we've, we could probably yeah. <laughs> <laughs> go on for hours. Um, questions? Uh, is there yeah. another microphone? Or, yeah, lovely. Anybody want to ask something or comment? Thank you. Um, thank you for the for this talk. It, it's wonderful um, as an introduction to your book, uh, which I haven't read yet, <laughs> um, but I did come across it. So, a um, couple of questions. One is um, your theories and activism. Uh, how much do you actually reach to the, the teachings like in academia? For example, uh, part of my degree course, we covered history and curating, but also a lot of architecture, but not once the word disability and architecture <laughs> came together. So I'm just wondering how much are you sort of yeah. in, infiltrating yeah. the, the um, universities yeah. um, to, to include um, disability yeah. within architecture and also yeah. for architecture courses themselves, which yeah. I'm not fully familiar with, but um, do they include disability and architecture as part of the, the yeah. modules? Um, so that's one thing. Um, sorry, I'm just, I had about three different things for you. <laughs> um, yes, and also, for example, um, as a theorist, um, who, who um, outside the academia, um, who is aware of your theories? Mm -hmm. For example, my, my um, I, I wonder if people that actually, uh, like government, British government that makes, you know, policies and stuff, um, um, how open are they to, um, yeah. in, you know, uh, listen to your theories yeah. or theories alike? Yeah, yeah. Academia all together coming together as activists to say this need to be included. Yeah. Because if it's made as a policy or some sort of law, yeah. then architects will have to consider disability as, as part of the brief every time. Yeah. It won't be sort of optional. Yeah. Or um, you know, having extra money for that to include yeah. something special for disabled people. And also disabilities it's not only about access to, to a place. There's so many disabilities, and a lot of people suffer from uh, multiple disabilities, yeah. physical and also invisible, etc. Um, so how is the architect, architecture um, accommodating or, yeah. or could accommodate multiple disabilities within the realm? Yeah. Thank you. I, if the, um, how much time do I have? <laughs> I mean, the first thing is this book is written in the most... Um, um, sort of everyday language. It's not like a super academic book. It's a super disciplinary book. It's a book about architecture, but it's written in an extremely accessible language. Um, and so, in fact, um, I was, I'm not saying this to blow a lot of smoke, but just to they come, and I was on the morning news in the U.S. talking about this book, you know. So this is a very... You know, it was, it was published in the United States, as we say, as a trade book. It's by an academic publisher, but, but, but published for a broad audience. There's an audio book. You know, it's, it's meant to be very accessible. And to that end, uh, the city of New York, um, the person who's, I forget, the, de the Department of Design or something, the Design of Buildings, the, the, this is the department that commissions architects to design buildings 
Sport New York City, has asked me to speak to her entire staff. Many of them, you know, do everything from reviewing drawings to see if they are accessible to commissioning architects to overseeing building projects, right? So I'm already having conversations with municipalities about the ideas in the book, and which is very important to me. Um, it's not like a, you know, it's something that I need to work on, like thinking about how to communicate that. Um, so the presentation that I made here is very much like a Paul Mellon Center presentation <laughs> in an academic institution associated with an Ivy League school in the US. But the book um, is very approachable, you know. Um, so your, your other question about, um, and is meant to be used by cities as much as it is to be used by students or anybody, you know, um, or just disabled people who are interested in architecture but are not architects. Okay, um, so in terms of teaching, this is really important to me and it's sort of endless, right? So um, when I was a professor at the California College of the Arts, the school was beginning to undergo a series of transformations that would have had the first um, architecture program that was on one continuous um, ground floor of um, a city in the United States. And a fairly big school, not a, a super big department, but you know, about, you know, hundreds of students, I'd say, right, in the architecture program. Um, and so, and also just having me there recruiting students really impacted um, the kinds of people that might feel comfortable for going there. So for example, we had, I, I wanna put this in a sensitive way, but also you know, explain that we would have students apply that would make some of my colleagues extremely uncomfortable because they had such obvious um, neurological disabilities, right? But I was like, well, they should be able to study architecture as much as anybody else because of this reason, that reason, the other reason. Or I would say, often say in meetings, you would be in meetings and people would say, well, I don't feel comfortable having somebody like that you know, in an architecture school around, you know, knives and saws. I mean, these are ridiculous things to say, of course, but I would say, well, these are things that people said about women 40 years ago in architectural education, you know? So I think we all agree that's a good thing, right? That we have women in architectural education. So anyway, so recruiting, to use a crude word, and recruiting disabled people has always been super important to me. And I'm a mentor still for some students from there and, and others that have read the book and are like, I don't want to leave this profession, but it's hard for me because I have type one diabetes or because I'm a double amputee or anything. So that's endless. And in terms of my teaching, what I don't do is I don't teach studios that are like, we're gonna do a studio about a group of disabled people somewhere in the world. Um, what I do is I try to rethink how I teach studio, for example, or design courses as a disabled professor. So instead of pinups, we have sit downs. Drawings don't go on the wall, they go on the table. Sometimes you don't make drawings, you do explanations. When I had a very serious medical incident earlier in the year in which I couldn't give lectures, so we would have collective lectures, I'd print it out. It was like, almost like a, a Jewish Passover Seder. Everybody had like a signed role and we went around the room and they would read their part. Um, and then just having fun, like one of the projects I did was called the One Story City. So um, a lot of people don't know this, but many, building, many neighborhoods in New York, the majority of buildings are only one story tall. And a lot of, um, you know, people love these neighborhoods because of their accessibility or because of their usability. Also the um, verdure, the trees, the verdure, the trees in the neighborhood grow to very significant heights because they're not in shades of buildings. So they're lovely neighborhoods, but they're also the neighborhoods that are always threatened with gentrification because developers see the neighborhood of one story buildings and are like rub their hands together and think they'll turn it into a dense development. So in that, we figured out ways to preserve the one story city, intervene in the one story city and the most fun was that each of the students had to take a controversial multi-story building, like the Vessel in New York by Thomas Heatherwick, of course you know from here, um, Statue of Liberty, um, oh, uh, um, uh, oh um, that very slender, super tall apartment buildings by Ethel Vignoli, and they had to interpret it into a one-story form. <laughs> so that was a lot of fun. So the, you know, I try to have fun with students around the topic of impairment, that having a professor that can take you on endless journeys around the city or likes to sit down, that these are opportunities to have a lot more fun in studio or to think about studio in a completely different way. So, yeah. Cool. yeah. Um. <clears throat> I'm gonna rather selfishly ask you to speak about a project called Block Party, oh, because yeah. um, I, I was really interested in the kind of how you can design projects from a disability perspective while also considering these other approach or other perspectives and approaches or kind of more intersectional approaches and also some the idea of like 
approaching from perspectives where it does consider vitality and or incapacity and how you do action that and build it into practice or see an example of it in the real world. And I quite like that project, Block Party, and think that's quite a good um, just kind of example of how that could be enacted. So I'm very selfishly going to ask you to... Okay, yeah. yeah. So um, a few years ago, um, Barry Bergdahl, who's a, a very... Um, um, prominent um, historian and curator in the United States. He was the chief curator of MoMA's architecture program for a while. And Juliana Barton, who's also a curator, um, very involved with um, issues around um, motherhood and architecture, actually, um, and gender and architecture. They set out a call for visions of the U.S. city post-COVID, and they asked for people to engage with one of three or four different areas. One was race. Um, one was um, disability, one was age or um, elderly people in their experience city, and the other was children. And so disability was a very important and central um, theme running throughout the whole exhibition, and they were soliciting proposals from teams that they would then fund to work with these urban areas in the United States and develop urban plans. So I got together with um, Irene Cheng, who's a historian and sometimes practices, and a colleague of mine from long ago, and um, Brett Snyder, who's an architect in Berkeley, and we decided to put together a team that was mostly of disabled people. So Georgina Klieg was on our team. Jerron Herman is a very prominent disabled dancer. Chip Lord is a deaf and experimental architect, and, and many other people. It was a big team, it was like eight or 10 people. Rod Hen Henmine. <coughs> so, um, just the project itself was a lot of fun. We figured out a way to preserve every building in, that exists in the city and to do interesting strategies that were mostly around um, what we called a disability critique of property in terms of rethinking the property relations in a US city and how that does or does not work for disabled people. So single, and, and around subjects of race and gender as well. So single family zoning is very prominent in US cities, which mandates that you can only have one single, just like the name says, one single dwelling, one family living there. It's extraordinarily isolating for people that need care and help. It has been a way to create mostly white neighborhoods in the US because it immediately jack, um, raises the property values of neighborhoods. Um, and it has this kind of heteronormative kind of subtext um, that's often built into the kinds of houses that are built in those places. So our disability critique of property was ways to rethink these lots, their relationship to each other, and that. The most it was a really wonderful project, but the, the two things about the project that were really great and deals with architectural representation and just interviewing for an architectural job. So when Juliana Barton and, um, now I just, the name just, Barry Bergdahl um, interviewed us, the, you know, we had a blind teammate, a deaf teammate, we have me, you know, we had, you know, it was like a real interesting cast of architectural characters. So the first question is, what is this exhibition gonna look like? And Georgina said, I'm blind. I don't care what the exhibition looks like. <laughs> or they said, what is your installation gonna look like? She's like, I don't care what this looks like. And, um, and you know, it was just, it was such a great interview. And afterwards I thought, oh my God, I really hope they hire us because that was so fun and interesting and just unsettling for everybody um, in a good way. So anyway, so they did obviously commission us as one of the four teams and it was great because with Georgina we had to make collaboratively models that she could understand. So we made a tactile model of our proposal. You know this, but just for the audience. Um, so we wanted to make some tactile models that are made by museums, a particular around like, for like paintings or buildings to translate them into things that um, uh, visually impaired or very you know, blind, blind people can understand. They're often very crude and infantilizing um, versions of the works. So we wanted to make something that would make her laugh um, when she touched it, we looked at sex toys and toothbrushes and just made this really fun model um, that was, you know, had like um, tactile puns, so things that felt like braille but that actually were very deep and, and kind of stringy when you pushed your finger down. Um, so that was wonderful. And then we asked her, which was great, to narrate the experience of the tactile model to a sighted audience, which was really interesting. So people got to hear what this blind person was experiencing. And it also was a totally different representation of the project. It wasn't a reduction of the project, it was an expansion of it. And then we conducted all these interviews and we realized, oh, you know, now we have all this audio. That's also um, another way to experience the project. And so the audio was over the model and experience that we made a model. I mean, there were a lot of access things. We made a model. One of the best moments was we made this model base that um, 
in which you could roll your wheelchair up and get your face right into a model, which was something that a sighted person can easily do. So there was one person, um, Sasha, I can't remember his last name, came to the opening and just like wheeled right into our city. And um, that was great. So it was just, it was a great experience working with everybody. The process was as much fun as what we made in the end. And it was a really um, powerful, I think, intervention into that part of Berkeley that, that Irene and Brett, who, who actually live um, in that part of California, um, may or may not continue to try to implement in some way. But yeah, yeah, we'll see what the future of the project is. But they're very interested in, in seeing it, Brett in particular, move forward. I'm aware that basically this whole row has uh, yeah. like, <laughs> grabbed you for questions. What's that? Oh, right. <laughs> okay. it's, it's, it's a very good row. <laughs> We're all just very keen, very keen colleagues. Um, just my first point. Um, is this... A, I don't know if this It's is not a, actually on, but it's, it goes to oh the people God. online. I'm very sorry yeah. to everyone online that I just tapped the mic and you probably just had a very loud noise. Um, I don't know. Like, I've had... Um, thank you so much for this, so your presentation and your discussion. Um, Part of my reaction to it, I don't know, it's quite personal, like being someone who studied architecture as a disabled person and how utterly horrendous it was. Like, um, you can't, you know, I graduated, well, part one, 2009, part two, 2011. Um, you could not have completed that degree without multiple all nighters for each project, and it's just not possible. And then graduating and think, not seeing anywhere really for someone like me in the profession so I yeah. ran away to museums and haven't come back um, so yeah just want to say firstly no, just personal reaction is thank you for highlighting it um, but what I wanted to ask you about and I don't know if this is me kind of I don't know careering the conversation another way please do tell me to come back later um, if, if I am but um, as part of my role I've been to the Venice Biennale several times um, and obviously you talk about uh, academia and that's often a place where people bring these kind of, I guess, provocations and concepts and they're displaying it. The architectural community comes together to talk about these things. But yeah. every single time I've been, it's just, it's horrendously inaccessible. Um, and I remember seeing your project there, I think, uh, okay. 2018, was it? Uh, 2021, yeah. Yeah, that one, There's, yeah. Yeah, a few okay. different ones, but the one that was really mostly about disability. Yeah, exactly, yeah. and being frustrated as... Uh, where they put it, and, <laughs> right. and it was so dark, and I thought, oh my God, everything about this is lost. Right. Um, this great project that's just kind of in a corner. Um, and then this year going in the German pavilion, what they've done is seen, and you made me think of this when you were talking about heritage sites and who gets to interpret heritage sites and what does it actually mean, because obviously if you're building a building like the Capitol, you're making a statement, if you're, you know, all these kind of things. And they took their building, which was transformed oh, as right. almost right. kind of, put it bluntly, statement of the Ubermensch kind of nationalism, um, and installed a massive ramp on the outside, um, breaking down this concept of the perfectionist body as oh, essentially it's a white supremacist concept. Um, so I can see these glimmers of hope and people are bringing these conversations too, but I just kind of wanted to ask you about your experience <laughs> working at the Biennale, and I don't know if that's... Uh, Feel free to just not want to because it's bringing up yeah. terrible things, but um, I just wanted to know a bit about it. Uh, yeah. from um, point of view. Well, that's a trigger. <laughs> I'm very sorry. <laughs> David, would it, be, would it be okay? We have a couple of questions online as well. Okay. So if you if we did all of them and then, was they kind of similar, asking for experiences oh, okay. Okay. as well? Okay. So, yeah. um, okay. so maybe, maybe then you could answer them yeah. all together, if yeah. that's okay. Uh, so the first question um, is that it seems that there are some disabilities that are more on a spectrum rather than binary. Uh, for instance, lung conditions that so-called sensitive groups have, instead of designing upgraded air handling buildings for sensitive groups, it would be better to design that way for all people. Uh, when there are days of air quality, disease outbreaks, uh, etc., uh, everyone needs these upgraded designs. Thoughts? So that's question one. And I had a follow-up question, uh, actually, this is not from an online audience, uh, but for me about the kind of uh, the relationship between public health and um, sort of uh, buildings in some sense and, and uh, disability and mm. access in, in, in the sense that a lot of, um, well, impairments are, are a result of long-term public health outbreaks as well and, yeah. and do, do architects and spatial people talk, talk to public health officials or what, it, what is the kind of gap that's happening there? <coughs> you um, better at that one. Well, no, I was just thinking, I mean, yeah. I think that you cover both, 
those yeah. issues in the book really well. Yeah. And yeah. I guess we haven't talked about them at all, about the, the chapter on uh, environment. Yeah. So maybe yeah. that yeah. would just be worth very briefly <clears throat> okay, yeah. summarising, if you yeah. don't mind. Yeah, and sure. then yeah. you can talk about Venice if you want okay, to or yeah. not. We'll do it in that order. To... Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, yes. So um, one of the things that I looked at in, in the book is um, how ideas of normalcy, which are very well researched by um, uh, scholars of disability and architecture, Barbara Penners here, Joss Boys, of course, does that work. Um, Amy Hamrai is very good in this area, Bess Williamson, there's uh, David Serlin. There's so much excellent work about normalcy in architecture, often relying around the, the, um, the, the physical form or the, bio, the biomechanics of human bodies or the um, even ideas about like digestion, for example. Um, one of the things that I wanted to bring to that was, which I've worked on for years um, in earlier work, was ideas about environmental norms. And what would it, and there are very good disability critiques of environmental um, norms, like Michelle Murphy's mm -hmm. work on sick building syndrome, for example. Um, but I wanted to think about like what a, I guess I'd like to keep, I don't want to keep reusing this word um, ad nauseum, but like a disability critique of the environmentalization of space, right? So in the book, um, I sort of chart how, um, you know, building off the work of people like Beatrice Colomine and others, how like um, tuberculosis inspired um, ideas about air and space, and then some of my own work about um, the solarization of urban space. This, this complicated term simply describes the belief that bringing more and more direct sunlight into urban space and buildings is an automatic good, as well as just the kind of norms that are built into space, building off people like Michelle Murphy's work. I'm trying to rethink all of that. And so, um, just within the book, one of the, um, the arguments, I suppose, is, is that something like darkness, as Joss was mentioning earlier, which is seen as something that we just think like an architect doesn't build darkness into the city, that sounds um, bizarre to us, that in the age of climate change, this is something that we may need to rethink as a kind of value, like not just shade, but like how do you bring darkness into urban space? Um, and, and into the interiors. It's something that's immediately associated with sickliness, but that's not necessarily the case. And then finally, in the end, there's something of a sort of fantasy that I get into, which is if you look at a variety of thinkers and how they've thought about environment critically, like how could we imagine interior space not as an environment that like acts on us, right? We're in this room that's a little stuffy, right? But how can um, environment, right? or the environment we need, or want, or desire, how can it be something that we achieve somehow, both collectively and individually in a space? So, and what would that be? Right? It's a very, it's, it's in a way, it's a more democratic idea of what an environment in a building might be than, a, than like an air handling system, which is, which is a democratic concept. Like, we have studied norms and averages, and we're giving everybody an equal amount of, of air and cooling, but it doesn't work. Right. So rethinking how the interior of a building can create much more heterogeneity. I don't know exactly what that looks like, but if there's a patron sitting online somewhere that wants to fund an installation about that, I would love to work on that. But that is very interesting. And in, the, in that chapter, you know, I talk a lot about my own experience as an amputee, as someone who's had enormous amounts of chemotherapy as a young person, and how that affects my, among many, many other things that I don't need to get into now, but how that affects my ability to to quote unquote regulate my own experience of environment and comfort and how I have a very peculiar relation to these things. And so that's, that's in there as well. Anyway, um, so, um, and that relates to public health, of course. Yeah. So as for the Biennale, uh, um, well, when we did our prior, when Hashem Sarkis and I were first talking about doing something about disability, having done one previous installation at the Biennale, um, which was about actually translating historic monuments into an audio form. It was all about like how you could do that. Um, Brendan Cormier commissioned that, which was a fun project. Also, to, like what Joss was saying, it was about disability, but I didn't feel comfortable saying that at the time. This was eight or nine years ago. Um, I, in, when Hashem Sarkis's Biennale, I proposed doing something where we would simply make the site more accessible, all of it. And they felt like it would be too critical of the Venetian <laughs> managers, <laughs> plus the difficulty of imagining paying that for that, because they really wanted something much more modest from us. So yes, it's sad that, I think our project made people a little uncomfortable, so which is why it was stuffed in the corner, but, um, but yes, there's a lot more work to do there. And I honestly, I didn't need, well, we both know this, 
I, I have, it's an, for me, as somebody who has a mobility disability, it's an impossible city to navigate. In fact, when I went for the opening for Benjamin Cormier's exhibition, one of my experiences was being on a Vaporetto and falling into Liam Young's arms and him catching me because I couldn't stand up. And he went, oh, what's this? Okay. <laughs> and I said, oh, you know, I wear an artificial leg. I, I can't stand on a boat, you know. <laughs> anyway, but the point is, is, um, Yes, there could be a lot more work done to create work about um, impairment, weakness, disability, especially in a post-COVID world. Yeah. yeah. But also, that, um, is it worth mentioning that that um, the genesis of that installation and that uh, iteration one? of the Biennale, the recent one, came about during the pandemic? That's right. Yeah. So that added a whole other layer of like. Do we travel, sorry, I'm David's partner, do we travel to Italy at all? Yeah. Are, are people going to Italy? What does it mean to, to create an installation from afar? And you yeah, know, yeah. I, I think just in light of the questions around public health, the fact of the timing of that particular Biennale relative to the mm -hmm. pandemic yeah. was interesting, you know, added an, another sort of set of complexities, yeah, right? Yeah, it was tough. Yeah. 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 I wanted to say well, okay. Oh, right, okay, right. So again, yeah. this is yeah. Yeah. But what's interesting is, as a city with many um, uh, Catholic pilgrimage sites, it's been a city in which people with very serious impairments, this is one of your, have been going to for hundreds and hundreds of years. So, and the, and the city in which the idea of quarantine, of course, um, has a very important role, right? You know, so there's a lot there, right? That's just not explored by the managers. Yeah. I think we're kind of coming to the end of time. End of time. Yeah. <laughs> well, we are. This is clearly going right. to happen. <laughs> um, I mean, I think, so we have... Do you want to do ones online? Or? Yeah. We've just got one um, at the back. We've got another one over we here. We have a couple of questions online, but I think also that, you know, we are going to continue the conversation yeah. as well. We're just going to move to the next room, have some drinks, and keep talking. Okay. So if, if that's okay, maybe I'll just quickly ask a question on that, yeah, from no, no, online so that you can yeah. actually um, respond to them as well. Yes. Um, you get the direct yeah. answer. <laughs> so there's, there's a few, and I think just to say to the online audiences as well, even if we don't make all of them, we can, we'll pass them on to David. Um, uh, and if there are any um, specific things, we'll pass them back on to you. Um, one of them is about, well, we have <laughs> things coming in <laughs> as we speak. Okay. Um, but one, one is about uh, academic athleticism and how to counterbalance competitiveness of scholarship and mm -hmm. academia that Joss also mentioned. Um, is slow scholarship um, one way out of this? And I think in a slightly somewhat connected um, strain, how do we empower allyship and collaborative opportunities, mm -hmm. particularly for spectrum-related conditions and neurodiversity, to support good, inclusive, and accessible design and increase action <laughs> with accountability? <laughs> yeah. So I think take an hour. The, yeah, the big, the big, big questions. But I think maybe even just a... Uh, point to the fact that these are questions being asked and this is the kind of thing that is uh, triggered by um, your book and your talk. Well, I just, I just wanted to add, because it, it does bring those two things together, that we've been doing some work at UCL where it's really clear that the way in which it's been mainly neurodivergent students who have responded and the way in which they've responded has been very <clears throat> frustrated and angry with the way that assumptions are made that they're not performing correctly and a lot of that is about this you know it is a refusal and a resistance to and a, a, a lack of um, thriving under a system that does is competitive is around this kind of working all hours yeah. I mean I I think it is it's in really interesting in terms of kind of what sort of productions we make and I know that you've talked about it in terms of practice but for me it's very interesting in terms of uh, research and publication because again you know you have to get the funding for that it's like I mean it's seen you know it's something that I don't I don't do in many ways because I'm, in, I'm an independent scholar and I don't have access to that time I can't afford that time so um, I guess there's all of that too about yeah. you know the research how you manage to do research I mean if you're doing this research over a long yeah. period yeah, I mean, for me, it's just, it began, like, you know, everything has a beginning with academia, which is everybody's always a student. So as a teacher, you just try to create a um, context, an environment in which, like, um, I don't know, I'm trying to think of the word, 
one's vitality does not equal one's capacity, yeah. right? And like how you can communicate that to a student. Somebody brought that up yesterday at the talk and I thought that was a dancer, right? Yeah. Um, at the talk we did yesterday. I thought that was so, so important. So, I mean, just some very simple examples for any of you who teach in the room. I give my lectures to my students in three different formats, or really four, technically. They can watch me. They can listen to me later. It's as just audio. I, I, just like this, I describe every image. They can read it. <laughs> or they can just look at the pictures and have a visual. So just even that. I have to tell you, not, you know... <laughs> In the US, I don't know if they do this here, we get these student evaluations where people go into great detail about how they did or do not enjoy your teaching. And um, one of the things that students always say, particularly ones that come out as being, having um, you know, neurodiversity or neurodivergence is thank you for giving the lectures in four different formats because I can't sit there and watch you for an hour. So, but I can listen and I can listen in pieces or I can read. You know, so that just, just little things like that. And of course it's not competitive when you do that, right? It's not like, oh, the ones who can take down every note that I see in the room are the winners, right? As a colleague, you know, it's always hard. It's a colleague, it's very hard because we are encouraged, I think, um, to be in competition with each other in ways that's very strange. And I think there's so much work. I think the, the new generation of academics are doing a lot to change that. My generation was horrible. Um, so, um, you know, I think, there's, I think things are changing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we will uh, say goodbye to um, our colleagues online and uh, say a big thank you to David thank and you. Joss. Um,